to proudly announce the first international keynote speaker at PGM Open ever. Mr. Michael Young from the University of Canberra. And Michael, Michael has conducted a research on uh, or global research on the failure of programs. What struck me most in your research findings was the title, They Didn't Understand Programs. Michael Young. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful welcome. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yep, good, excellent. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to come and speak at PGM Open. Uh, I was very excited to, to come here and it's obviously taken uh, some hours to arrive here from Australia. So just to, I guess, give some introduction and some background. Uh, so I'm from Canberra, which is the national capital of Australia. Uh, so down here in a small corner of the universe and it's really good because we, uh, we're off in the corner of the world and we do some fantastic things and we take from uh, the rest of the world all the great ideas and all the great concepts. But it's just a damn long way to go anywhere. <laughs> so Canberra's the national capital, um, our Parliament House, our uh, National War Memorial. And every spring in September, so we're in the Southern Hemisphere, so spring is September, uh, we have the largest uh, flower festival in the Southern Hemisphere. And every year there's over a million tulips planted uh, in, in Canberra uh, for a free public uh, garden. And it was a, a, a gift on our 200th anniversary, the bicentenary, and uh, it's been modelled off the Kugenhof here in, in Netherlands. Okay, so. And of course my passion is actually hockey. Who likes hockey? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So yes, so I, I play hockey, uh, probably not so well. I, I coach hockey, my children play hockey, um, I umpire hockey. Um, yeah, and so... <laughs> no, that's not me, by the way. <laughs> I, I wish. Okay. So, how I got involved with programs is a bit of a, a long story, and uh, I was originally in the, in the army, in the military and found myself in this job called project management. And it was a weird set of circumstances, and over time, over about 10 years, I, I got involved with projects that were larger and larger and larger. And the first program I got involved with was to relocate the airport in Hong Kong. Now, at the time, we didn't know what a program was, we hadn't thought about what programs were, but what it was was to shut down the world's, one of the world's busiest airports in the most populated part of the planet and move the airport 40 kilometres from here to there oh, and we had six hours to do it. <laughs> six hours. And so, I'm not sure whether you know much about airports but obviously planes take off and land, there's air traffic control and so on. And the old airport runway was shut down at 1am the new airport runway came on to, uh, into action at 6 a.m. and the first plane that was due to land took off four hours before we started. <laughs> and so you're probably thinking, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Well, the world's media thought it was, so they had 3,000 cameras there waiting for us to fail. <laughs> Except it didn't, which is a bit of a any climax in a way. And so, took that experience, and then I did, started doing a lot of work with government back in, uh, in Canberra, working for government, and the first, I guess, recognised program I worked on was in 2002, and here we have uh, all of our trade commissions and embassies around the world. And I got invited in, spoke with the, the senior manager, the client, and they said, we've got this program for you to do, and we need to replace all of the IT infrastructure around the world. Oh, and by the way, we're moving to a new data centre and we're going from a, I'll talk techno stuff now, going from a Novell type platform to a Microsoft platform in technology land, Active Directory had only just come into play. Oh, we're doing that as well. Oh, and by the way, you've got seven months. <laughs> and then he said, I've got another meeting now, so um, <laughs> good luck with that. 
Okay. So uh, learned some things in that, and uh, what I guess I learned initially, you know, going over ten years ago now, is that program management is not project management. It takes a different way of thinking, a different mentality, a, a different approach. Okay. And so maybe. I was lucky, maybe I was fortunate, maybe I was in the right place at the right time, but that was the start of program management for me. And so since then I've had some really interesting opportunities. Um, I worked with, uh, with Peter Cosmans on uh, ICB4, and uh, we, we together with other colleagues around the world put together um, particularly the program management and portfolio management piece in ICB4. Uh, I've worked on uh, the PMI um, portfolio management standard, uh, currently working with the ISO uh, standards uh, on uh, program management, uh, ISO standard as well as uh, portfolio and so on. And in a little moment I'll show you where the ISO program management standard is at. It is still very early, so it will change, but I'll give you a sneak peek. Um, I've also worked with the Australian Mirror Committee um, with ISO, developed national qualifications in program management, chaired the national committee. Um, within our vocational training sector. Um, a few other things, uh, part of the, um, I'm on the, the board of the Australian Institute of Project Management where I oversee professional advancement standards and so on. And when I'm not doing all of that, I'm doing some research with Canberra University um, and involved with uh, a few different businesses, some startups, and as well as uh, GPM where I'm the Vice President of Research, okay? And uh, we're doing a whole pile of things in relation to sustainability, and I'm gonna come back and talk about some of those key points um, in a little, little while. Now, I guess what I've learned from all of that is that I've been exposed to lots of different countries, lots of different cultures, lots of different ways of thinking about program management. And, what I wanted to, I guess, talk about today is uh, a bit of summary of that experience, share with you some of the uh, outcomes from the research I've done. Uh, it's been predominantly uh, around programs in government, and so I understand that there's a, a few people from government here. And so I talk about programs, program management, and then also, uh, I guess, get us to raise the bar, challenge the thinking. Okay? One thing I've discovered is that generally program management around the world is, is quite poor. And one of the things I'd like to challenge all of you as program management experts in the Netherlands is how can you help raise the bar around the world? There's some great books that have been written. Unfortunately, I can't speak or read Dutch. Um, and there's a large world out there that also can't speak and read Dutch. And so one thing I'd like to see all the authors in the audience is to actually translate things into English and make it available for the rest of the world because the world will be very thankful and grateful for that. They're after guidance. And so, in putting together some research and thinking about what I was going to speak about today, I came across this quote by um, Sergio Pellegrinelli. And so, Sergio uh, did a lot of work about 2006, about 10 years ago, on program management. And what he identified is that when individuals involved with program management get together, they spend time talking to each other, trying to understand what each other means by program management. So here we are 10 years later, and I don't think we necessarily have progressed much from this. <laughs> okay? And once again, it's something that I think we need to all challenge ourselves on because in 10 years' time, we don't want to be having these same conversations over and over again. Let's move forward, let's move on. And so, one thing I thought about is that, well, what is a program? You know? Pellegrinelli sort of says that program managers still need to figure out what we're all talking about, so let's start at the beginning. What is a program? The problem is no one really has a clear understanding. We've got different perspectives. And so, is a program one of these things? You go to the theatre and it gives you a list of what's on. Is a program a whole pile of computer code? Because some people think that's what a program is. In the construction sector, a schedule is called a program. Is it a TV program? Okay. Is it an education and learning program? So we learn some stuff over time. Or is it a whole pile of different things, programs, that are delivered by government 
and they appear as line items in a government budget. What's a program? And so these are some of the really fundamental conversations we've been having in writing the ISO standard. What is a program? Because when you've got 65 people from 65 different countries and a multitude of different languages, a multitude of different cultures, we all need to be speaking the same language. Okay? And I don't mean about English, French, Dutch, whatever. I'm talking about we need to understand each other. And so whilst we might translate from one spoken language to another, the meaning doesn't always translate. Now, to make matters worse, we have a number of standards published in English that much of the world goes and looks at. And so we have uh, here uh, MSP that gives a definition of programs. We have, uh, this is the old, from the old ICB, but uh, the competence baseline gives us a definition. And we've also got PMI gives us a definition. Now, when you look at it, yes, there's some common threads here. We've got related projects, we've got benefits, we've got things like strategic objectives. However, philosophically, these are quite fundamentally different. And where it becomes interesting is that you put a bunch of people in the room, some of who have come from, uh, I guess, a European perspective of programs and share this sort of, this general strategic type perspective. Those that have come from a North American um, sort of background tend to share this type of perspective. And you almost have punch-ups in the, in the room because they say, no, 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 that's not a program. No, 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 that's not a program. And so you get this argument goes on. And so after the ISO meeting, I thought, well, just to get things clear on my own mind, I, I put together a blog post. And I wrote about what is a program. And what I included in the post was this particular um, table here. And this is drawn out of uh, the GAP standard for program management. Okay? And it really sums up why we have a problem. And so generally, the European perspective tends to be this is our view of what a program is. It's strategic. It's about delivering outcomes. It's about related projects. Uh, the, the end goal is clear, but the way we get there is not so clear. Okay? And it may be uh, evolving. It may be agile in nature. But we're here to deliver a strategic outcome. But we also have this operational program, okay? which may, may be that we put projects together to make it more efficient. Okay? There may not actually be a strategic reason to do it, but we put them together because it's efficient. Okay? And we then have multiple projects, and we then also have mega projects. Some of the challenges are that if you go back before 2006, a lot of the definitions of program management you could take the word, out pro, uh, word program out and replace it with the word portfolio, and that would also apply. So I'm not surprised that people are confused. Now, what's really interesting is a couple of things. I had some really fantastic feedback um, from around the world after I published this. And most people were going, oh, fantastic, I understand, that's really good. And so that was kind of cool. But I also had a few people come back and saying, no, 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 there is no one, there is no, uh, there's no, only one definition. There is not more than one definition. You're just making things up. <laughs> You're just confusing people by saying that programs are a range of different things. You're not helping. And so I thought that was an interesting perspective. So I then sort of pondered the thought, well, so if we've got lots of different definitions and we've got different ways of thinking about it, how do we resolve this? How do we all get on the same page here? Do we create the ring, the uber definition? Do we create the one definition that actually prevails over all others? Or do we have a series of definitions that are applicable to different industries, different types of programs, but then we as an organisation or as a group of people identify what a program is to us? Okay. And so when you start to look at where some of these challenges come into play, I, I, I think about one of the guys who we're working with in ISO. He works for the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. And he, in, in, in Boeing, there's two very different types of programs that operate. There's this type of program, which is designing a new type of aircraft. So we've built a 787, we've, we've, we're building a 797 now. So designing and building a completely different type of aircraft. 
And so that 12, 14, 20 year program to actually design and build the prototype, test and so on, would be something like this. And so they have program managers that do that. But they also have program managers that do this. So once you've built the prototype and it's been proven, they then assign a program manager to build a whole pile of the aircraft of the same type for KLM or for Qantas or for Cathay Pacific. Well, they're also a program manager. Okay? So even within Boeing, where they deliver everything they do by program and by project, they've got two competing definitions. And even those people then say, oh, are you uh, one of these or are one of those? Okay. So one, I guess, observation I've, I'd make is that um, quite often what we see is project, uh, program management is program management according to project managers. Okay? And what I mean by that is this, and so we're probably all familiar with PMBOK, I'm sure, scope, time, cost, quality, etc. But what we see quite often is this. We change the word to program management, but we're trying to talk about the same thing. Okay? So program management is not just project management relabeled. It's not project management upscaled. It takes a different way of thinking, a different mindset. Okay. And so when you then go and look at a range of different standards, and I'll just look at a few just to point out some, some examples here, what you commonly see is that it's program management according to project managers. And so here we have the, the um, PMI standard for program management, and we've got a process-based approach. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that this is good or this is bad or this is right or this is wrong. This is a particular view of program management. And this particular view may be relevant and applicable to your organisation, the types of work you do. Okay? But this is a perspective, okay? and it's all about a process. Okay? We have uh, MSP, okay? takes a slightly different perspective. And as we can see here, we've got business cases, uh, and in particular, there's a strong focus around benefits realisation. And I'll come back to that point uh, in a little bit. And we've got ISO. So I don't know whether the ISO police are going to bust in here at any time and arrest me and take me away for <laughs> disclosing intellectual property. But um, So this is where the ISO standard is currently at, and I'll just leave it up there for a moment because there's a fair bit to take in. But just to give you a, a brief snapshot, uh, it's in committee draft, which is the first, I guess, of the working drafts of a document. And so has anyone worked with ISO just as, out of interest? No, no. It may be a couple of you. And so there's a fairly rigid process that ISO goes through in terms of the development and refinement of standards. And so we can see here we've got a whole pile of definitional issues, uh, key principles. So we've been very much focusing on the principles of a program and not trying to define all of the details um, at the lowest level, but trying to define Philosophically, what is a program? What does it mean? What's the different way of thinking required? Keep it, keep it at that principles level. And then we start to look at some of the practices. And it's not a process standard, like ISO 21500. It's about practices, describes the practices rather than the step-by-step -step process. Okay. So understanding and being clear around what a program looks like, how it's governed, uh, what controls, benefits, and so on uh, may exist. So ISO, this standard will be released, I think it's in September 2017, uh, early 2018, so it's still a little way off. Um, but as they say, coming soon to a theatre near you. Uh, we have ICB, and as I mentioned, I had the privilege of working with Peter Cosman's uh, developing ICB, and this I'm not going to talk too much about it because I don't want to steal Peter's presentation, uh, which follows on afterwards, but it's a big shift in IPMA. We now have uh, a number of domains, projects, programs, and portfolios. Uh, we have the uh, different perspectives, so we have projects uh, or, or the practice element. We have the perspectives, uh, which are in the old ICB, uh, the context. And we also have uh, people. What are the innate competencies that you as an individual in program management need to, 
need to have, need to possess. Okay? And so I'll just leave it at that, and if you want to know more about it, Peter's presenting uh, straight afterwards. <laughs> we also have gaps. Um, has anyone heard of gaps at all? Gaps? Okay. No? Okay, so gaps, the Global Alliance for Project Performance Standards, uh, started by Lynn Crawford in Australia. Um, people like Bill Duncan, who wrote the first version of PMBOK, uh, and others are also part of that. And so they developed um, a standard, competence standard in program management. Okay, it's not particularly well used, but it's a standard that does exist out there. Okay? And as you can see, we've got you know, crafting, attainment of benefits, and so on. Now, what was interesting about this, and the reason I mention it, is that this was probably one of the first documents that identified program management, not projects, and it's also not about control. It's not about um, process. It's not about those sorts of things. It's, it's about, uh, I guess, the craft of program management. Okay? We're dealing with things that are not fixed. We're dealing with moving parts. Okay? And then when we go and look at some of the books that have been published in English, probably one of the best books that exists is this uh, book by Michel Thierry. And what he starts to introduce is that one of the big differentiators between projects and programs is we're dealing with high levels of uncertainty and high levels of ambiguity. So we're not really sure what's going to happen, and there are many possible outcomes that could occur. And so for me, this was sort of, I guess, one of the, 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 the books out there that really starts to, in my view, put program management in the space that it really is all about. Okay? We're not talking about process. We're not talking about detail. We're talking about big picture. We're talking about organizational change and the realisation of benefits. When you go and look at what's happening in the academic space, and in this space I'm only talking about things published in the English language, okay? there's not much, there's very little. And this is why I urge all of the budding authors or the existing authors out there to actually translate your books into English because they're going to be at the top of the bestseller list in the program space because there's so few that's actually out there in English. Okay? So what we see is that there's four common perspectives in the academic space. When you look at all the research that's been done, we see that program management's all about being a scale-up of projects. You know, they're just big projects. Okay? We've seen that it's a management framework for a number of initiatives. And so when you go and look at the uh, multi-project -pro program, that's sort of what that's talking about. Uh, it's an approach to implementing organisational change, so the focus there is on benefits, on outcomes, on change, and it's some sort of focus on strategic objectives. Now, just to be clear, these numbers, that's not the total number of papers. Um, in fact, the total number of papers is 43. That's it. There's 43 papers that have been written by academics in the English language, full stop. That's it. 43. All right. When you look at the numbers, some of the papers talk about a program is about this and about this. Okay? So program management is very much still in its infancy. The thinking hasn't really progressed, unfortunately. And so just to give you an example of what that practically means, okay? one of the programs I, I worked on uh, five or so years ago was for our environment, Federal Environment Department. And we had to replace, once again, IT assets and infrastructure around the country. Now, some of these locations are really quite interesting. So here you are in the middle of Australia, 3,000 kilometres from nowhere, right? and you are in a metal shed. And the metal shed would be maybe the size of this part of the audience. Okay? And it's 3,000 kilometres from civilization. And you've got to mount and put equipment into a place like that. And there were a whole pile of places like that around the country, which was kind of cool. The problem is that places like that, there's no um, electricity apart from when the generator's running. Um, the only connection is with satellites, and that's fine provided it's not cloudy or raining. Um, one site we went and visited, um, their system went down about a month ago, and they hadn't been able to figure out what had actually happened. And so we pulled all the equipment apart and found this fried lizard sitting in the, you know, and it had shorted out the system, you know. These, the people that work in these places literally wrestle crocodiles for a living. You know, think Crocodile Dundee for those of you, you know, who remember seeing that movie. Right? 
And so we had a, a, a program. There was 20-odd projects that were being delivered as part of this particular program. And it had the potential to do some really fantastic stuff. Now, a couple of observations. We had a lot of stuff that was front-loaded here, so we're trying to deliver stuff early. But it ran over a period of about 18 months. And it was a fairly significant technology change and therefore organisational change for this particular government agency. However, they used the term program, but they didn't really know what it meant. So they kept calling it the technology program, the technology program. And as a result, they did, because they didn't quite get it, what they wanted was an absolute guarantee of the date everything was going to be delivered. And, of course, being government, we're spending public money, we need to be accountable, we needed to know where every single dollar was being spent and exactly when it was going to be spent. Okay? From here for another two years. Okay? Oh, and we had the budget cycle in the middle there, which meant that you don't know whether you've actually got next year's funding yet. Just a minor, minor problem. Now, the, the problem they found, though, was that you've got 20 projects, you know, some of these things are fairly significant, m many millions of dollars, and they then couldn't understand why were all these project managers needed. Surely you just have one person, and they just magically do everything. And, of course, there was no PMO. I was the lucky program manager. And so I go away, I get this sort of phone call to say, oh, I know you're on Christmas holidays, but we, we don't need you anymore. We've decided to restructure to save some money. Well, it saved them some money, all right. It saved them, well, not quite. It actually cost them $12 million more than they planned. It was delivered three years late. They ended up with a really unhappy client, and it was the, the worst customer satisfaction rating they'd ever received in five years. Okay? All because they didn't get what a program was. They used the word, but they didn't really understand it. One of the other things that I see is that we also find that, and through the research, we found that the level of maturity is actually really low. And one of the exercises, one of the research projects we did was uh, to collect uh, maturity data across uh, 50 government agencies. Now, to provide just a bit of context, um, about five years ago, six years ago, our government went through a major IT procurement review. I'm not quite sure how IT procurement and program maturity sort of fit together, but apparently there was some connection. And one of the things that was mandated was that every government agency had to do a maturity review every year using P3, M3. Okay? And so here I was sitting around the university, as university type of people do from time to time, and I said, hey, there's all this data there. Let's go collect the data and just see what's there. And so we approached all the agencies, we got all of the data, and, and here we go. And what we've then done over the last three years is to collect the data every year just to see, well, what's changing, what's improving, what's happening. Okay. And so these are basically where we sit uh, currently. So just to explain P3, M3, um, so maturity model, you can't actually score zero in P3, M3. Right? If you do absolutely nothing, got no idea about maturity, got no idea what a program was, got no idea about really much at all, you score a one. <laughs> <laughs> so you score a one, okay? Maybe I think when they developed it, that if you gave somebody a zero, well, that probably had some negative vibe, so, you know, the lowest score is one. And the grey line here is where the agency started. In that first year of the review, they scored a one, just over a one, okay? And so when you then look at where they progressed to over a couple of years, they scored slightly more than a one. So we've made some progress. So we're slightly better off than have got no idea. We now have some idea, but we're really not quite sure. And so one particular example um, is that once we collected the, the data, what we then wanted to do was to go and speak to each of the organisations that seemed to have a higher level of performance in one area than others. And in essence, what we wanted to do was to go and find out, well, what are they doing? What's special about what they're doing? What's the secret source? How can we take what they've done and then take it to other government organisations and apply it elsewhere? 
And so one of the first organisations we looked at was the Commonwealth Superannuation, Superannuation Corporation. So this is the body that manages all of the pensions for government employees, for the military and so on. So uh, about $4.8 billion, um, about 580 odd thousand uh, members. Okay. And so in the uh, successive reviews, as we see, they started with absolutely no idea. They started with a one. Remembering we don't get zero. Okay. And they progressed to a two over the space of a couple of years. Now we were looking at uh, a range of different elements here and, and when you see in projects they progress uh, reasonably well from a 2 to a 3.4 and in a portfolio sense that actually moved ahead quite, uh, quite substantially as well. And so we weren't just looking at program management, we were looking at um, portfolios as well. And what we discovered through the process was that there were a number of key elements that stood out to us, why that actually made some really significant progress. Okay. The first one was that they had a sense of urgency. They had a reason to do this. And, and when you unpick the, the, the case study, what you see is that they were going to be given $40 million to implement a new system to manage their investments. But the central finance and treasury departments didn't trust them. Because the last time they did something like this, they started with $40, billion, uh, $40 million and turned it into $200 million and delivered nothing in the process. Okay, so they didn't trust them, so they needed a better way. So the new CEO came in, uh, made some significant changes and drove things from the top. And so what we saw clearly was that top management support is absolutely necessary. If you don't have top management support, the rest of it is basically a waste of time and money. Some other interesting findings though, they did a lot of work with the CFO, uh, particularly in their project identification, project selection. Okay? Making sure that they're doing the right types of projects and programs. And their budget was linked to it, um, they had an investment committee that was uh, at the senior levels. Uh, so they were doing a whole pile of really good things. They'd also done a lot of work on their project management methodology. And so when they were given this money to implement this new system as a program, what they tried to do was to take that project management stuff and then do some magic to it and try and use it then for the program, program delivery. Guess what? It didn't work. Probably comes as no surprise. So they tried to tweak their project management framework uh, and there were a whole pile of really interesting things that went on. The first one was that because these guys now started to get project management, they got the whole on time, on budget, you know, linear type way of thinking. They got that. So in rolls this program manager with a different way of thinking, different mindset and so on, and she's trying to work out, you know, programs and it's largely emergent and we've got a whole pile of moving parts and of course we don't have the one, two, three step by step process. Okay. And politically, that created a really interesting scenario because the other senior managers in the organisation thought she was building an empire. They thought she was just trying to get a whole pile of money to do a whole pile of things, but because she didn't have a fixed budget and she didn't know exactly what was going to be happening on the 13th of June 2017, she was making it up as she went. Okay? And so the whole political environment fell apart for this particular person. She subsequently left. But when you go and look at what she was doing, if she could write the textbook on program management, it would be the textbook. She was doing some fantastic stuff, but it wasn't project management, and the organisation, once again, just didn't get it. Okay. One thing we found is that, as part of this research and part of the work in ComSuper, was that maturity models, by their very nature, have some holes in them. And it's not a criticism of measuring maturity or maturity models, but they don't always measure everything. And so, for example, with P3M3, uh, what we found is that top management support, which I mentioned before, is absolutely critical. It's not actually measured in P3M3. Okay? And when you look at other maturity models, it's largely not measured. So what we tend to see in tools like maturity models is that we see process. And process isn't bad, but just because you follow the process, that doesn't mean you're going to produce a fantastic set of benefits at the other end. 
So top management support, really critical. And so when you look at the research, there's a whole pile of different things that just don't appear in maturity models. You know, uh, senior management support, um, clear definitions of what success is, etc. Now, in relation to the P3M3 model, there's a dimension called generic attributes. And what these generic attributes are are, are things like um, training, things like um, you have a governance system in place, things like you have reporting, you make decisions when they need to be made, and so on. Okay? And what we found was that in relation to this particular model, those generic attributes are highly correlated to, uh, to maturity. So if you actually can make the right decisions at the right time, if you have senior managers support what you're doing, guess what? Your score will go up in this maturity model. Okay? The thing that's interesting, though, is that all the other things that you're measuring using that model may not actually be that relevant. Okay? One thing about P3M3, too, is that we have these different dimensions it examines. Okay? But the way it works is that you're given a score from one to five. And the score that's reported publicly is the lowest number. So in this case here, this organization, because benefits management is a score of one, i.e. no idea, <laughs> they're rated as a one. Yet we can see that they're doing some other reasonably good things. So what it prompted us to think about was that, well, you know what? we've got these different dimensions, is there one of them that's more important than the others? So we started to look at what that was. Now, the government was doing this to improve outcomes, to improve the delivery, to improve benefits. And so what we started to then tease out was to say, well, if that's what the focus is, which one of these things are more important? Are some of them more important than others? And we saw that We've got finance and resource. Well, when you look at those on time, on budget, and so on, that's all about project management success. So just because it's been delivered on time, on budget, that's fantastic. But if you don't deliver any outcome, then it's a waste of time and money. So what we found was that we've got a number of elements here which are more important than the others. Now, that created a whole pile of interesting conversations with consulting firms. Because when you look at a lot of the, the work that had been done by consulting firms doing these reviews, they said to the government organisations, well, just go back one, if, if you're currently here a two, our recommendations are you need to be a three. And being academics, we went in and said, well, that's great, so you're currently a two, you need to be a three. Why? And they just said, well, because three is better than two and you need to get better. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, my two-year-old son could come up with a better logic and rationale than that. Okay. So that created a bit of a, a few waves, as they say. Okay. So we need, to, we need to get better. The second thing we thought about was, well, if we need to get better, given that not all of these are equally important, with limited time and money, where do we best spend our effort? Where do we actually focus what we spend our time on? And so we started to look at this, remembering that the best outcome we're after is to improve benefits. Okay? And so what we identified is this. So this is across all of the government agencies, and just to explain how to read this, because it's a bit of a convoluted type graph, is this yellow line here is where the organisations are currently at for portfolio, and the dotted yellow line is where they probably need to be. The blue solid line is for uh, projects, and the dotted line is where they need to be. And the white section here is where they are currently for programs. And the pink line here is where they need to be. So to decode what this means, what we saw was that we've got really some key elements here that we need to focus on. If we focus on stakeholder engagement, focus on governance, and improve some of the, the budget focus, that in itself, because of the way these things work together statistically, that was actually going to create the outcome that we're after. Now, it's not to say that we don't focus on benefits, because as we can see, we're going from not much more than we've got no idea to um, something just above three. Three is considered best practice. So if you were to pick up something like MSP as a standard and apply it as per the book, you would be operating at level three. Okay? So what we're suggesting is they still need to be better than best practice. 
And so, another case study. We went and spoke with the uh, Department of Education. And so the Department of Education uh, spends billions of dollars every year improving education around the country. And so one thing we saw as part of the, that exercise is that we went and looked at what, the, what they're doing. We went and looked at their budget papers. And like all government agencies, we've got budget papers, and in the budget papers we have um, uh, a whole pile of, of numbers. And as we can see here, we're delivering a whole pile of programs. So a program around school support, programs around training centres, uh, youth support and so on. You know, this is straight from the budget. And we have some overarching outcome here we're trying to achieve. And so focusing on benefits, we thought, well, what do we do? How do we do it? How do we improve what the organisation is doing? And we sort of stumbled across this situation where they've got all of these uh, terms, uh, different things here called programs. Now, as we know from a bit earlier, as I mentioned, we don't really know what programs are. And so that's a challenge in itself. Okay? But we thought, well, when the government's spending money, what are they spending it on? How are we going to actually achieve the outcomes? So what we wanted to do was to go through the process of trying to validate the actual logic behind what they're doing. Okay? So we put together some uh, logic maps, which I'll look at. And obviously, we've got different uh, different things across the department. We're spending, you know, billions of dollars every year. And for the first program, what we tried to do was to say, well, here we go, we've got these different programs uh, being developed and being managed. We have a series of key performance indicators in the budget papers themselves. And the outcome they're trying to achieve in this example here is a better start in life. And this is where our head started to seriously hurt because we could see what these programs were, we could see where the money was being spent. Okay? However, there was no connection between what was happening here and this best start in life. Okay? And so when you actually started to test the logic, it didn't work. So through all of these different programs, we're delivering improved access to quality childcare services. Okay, and manage, magically that's going to result in a best start in life. We had something slightly missing from the equation, the fact that children are born and remain healthy. But that seemed to escape the agency. And so we kept going and going and going, and we found the same problems, is that we, we had $8 billion being spent here, but we couldn't really see how that related to uh, retention rates in students and staff, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. So what we tried to do was use that logic diagram, that, that, uh, that mapping of here's the programs, here's the outcome we're trying to achieve, and going from there, doing these things, does it result in this? And guess what? It didn't. At which time, one of the senior executives in the organisation said, thanks, we don't need you to do any more work on that. Uh, we've got something else for you to do. <laughs> And so, of course, deferring to their much uh, greater wisdom and, and uh, understanding, we decided to, to comply with his request. And so, what I sort of saw is that benefits management generally wasn't well understood. Uh, benefits are not often uh, measured, and in many cases, they're not even measurable. Okay? Obviously, we've got certain KPIs there, which is fantastic, but often we don't even measure the benefits because we can't. There's an alignment issue that often happens too between organisations, um, between projects, programs and the organisation strategy. And so a lot of the work I've been doing in my PhD research recently is looking at that notion of alignment. I'm focusing on strategy execution, delivering strategic outcomes. But part of the assumption is that we actually have something that's going to deliver those in the first place and the examples I've just shown you, clearly it doesn't. One of the things that I think we also need to think about too is well, you know what, benefits management, I think we're actually missing the point here. There's a broader set of benefits we hadn't necessarily thought about, and that really comes into this notion of sustainability. So, changing gears slightly, and I know I've only got a few minutes left. Okay? So, the world's facing some pretty big problems. Okay? Last year, we, in Paris, we had the uh, COP21 uh, Climate Change Convention where every government in the world agreed to make, uh, take action on climate change, as an example. Okay? 
But we're seeing, certainly in Australia, bushfires are a big issue. Okay? I understand here it was the hottest summer you've ever had on record. Um, also, talking to colleagues in places like Canada and the US, they had no snow on Christmas Day. In Canada, uh, a friend in Ottawa, they had 14 degrees on Christmas Day. The following day it was minus 27, so everyone was happy again, but <laughs> it was 14 degrees on Christmas Day. Um, we've got some social issues around the world in terms of rights for education. We've got a whole pile of, of garbage. Uh, a colleague of mine, Joel Carboni, was in Lebanon uh, speaking recently, and the government hasn't done rubbish collection in the city for over two years. There's rubbish absolutely everywhere. He says it's like living in a garbage tip. Right? So we've got some challenges. And the reason I talk about this is that my view of program management is that program managers are change agents. We are the people that create the future uh, that we want to see. Okay? We're the ones that actually change organisations. We're the ones that um, deliver on some of these big problems and big challenges. Okay? And so one of the things that we've been doing in the work I've been doing with, with GPM is doing some work on uh, sustainability. And the way we approached this initially was through benefits. Because when you think about what benefits are, currently we're thinking largely about the benefits within the organisational setting. But if we open our minds and expand our horizons, what we actually see is that we're, uh, in our programs we can deliver benefits not just for the organisation, but for our customers, for our stakeholders, uh, for future generations. Okay? One thing that sort of came as a real, uh, I guess, shot in the face, uh, I was at a conference in Stellenbosch, South Africa in November. And a guy from South Africa was presenting about um, the fact that we live on a planet that's resource constrained. And being in the project program space, we get the whole resource constraint thing. And so what he was talking about was that in November, which was when the conference was, he was talking about the fact that in a year, we've got roughly an allocation of resources as a planet that we can use. Well, by August last year, we were starting to use our resource allocation for 2016. Okay? And so we're spending tomorrow's resources today, which creates a challenge. And so when we talk about sustainability and start to think about the benefits that we need to focus on, it's not just about green things, it's not just about environment things. There's a human rights issue. One thing that went to, uh, it was really, you know, just to illustrate the point, in, uh, in Australia, um, we're starting our school year. Uh, my children started school yesterday. And so all of the, the local department stores and the, uh, have been advertising, you know, school uniforms. Okay, start of the school year. And one of the cheaper department stores advertised school uniforms for $2. Right? Guess what was put on the internet within 10 seconds of that ad being released? Photographs of that uh, organisation's factory in Bangladesh and the slave labour and the child labour that they use to produce the school uniforms. Guess what happened to their advertising campaign? It was pulled within hours. It was a risk that they hadn't considered. Okay. And so, as I say, we need to expand our perspective on benefits. There are environmental, social and other economic benefits, not just what we're doing. One thing we've done in GPM, just very briefly, is to uh, develop a, uh, a model where we look at um, the various sustainability elements in relation to the organisation and in the program. And we're looking from four perspectives. The organisation, what happens within change initiatives, i.e. programs, what happens in the supply chain, and what's the stakeholder's perspective. We're using a slightly different measurement model. We're not talking about necessarily, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, like maturity models, but we're saying we've got some ad hoc approach, we've got some understanding, we've got in place all of the important things, and then we've got degrees of excellence. Okay? So we're starting to see this as being adopted and used by different organisations. We did an assessment recently in an organisation, and this is a, a, an organisation that delivers sustainable housing, social housing. And they were almost convulsing. They were almost being sick all over the floor when they actually went through this and thought about it. So they're a not-for-profit organisation. They're delivering social outcomes. It's all about improving people's lives. And what they suddenly discovered was that when we looked at what they were doing, okay, they were currently at uh, a score of two. 
Two means ad hoc. Two means we're not really sure what we're doing. And what the real eye-opener for them was, was that when they, they were doing some great things as an organisation, but they had no visibility of what was happening in their supply chain. And they then suddenly realised that they had a, a, a set of issues facing them that had the ability to actually kill their organisation overnight. Okay? Just imagine if you're a not-for-profit, your mission is about improving people's lives, and then you suddenly discover, because it turns up on the front page of the newspaper, that one of your subcontractors is employing uh, illegal immigrants and they're being paid $10 a day or $10 a month to do work on a construction site using unsafe practices and you're paying the bill. That's probably not going to end well. So yes, they had a bit of an eye-opening moment. Okay. Um, some research just in this space very briefly is that if you think it doesn't happen, yeah, it's, it's probably going to happen. So 70% of, in this case, companies' earnings is at risk from um, issues like this. What does that mean for program managers? Well, guess what? We're going to be called on to deliver some of these changes. We're going to be called on to improve the situation, and we need to expand our thinking beyond that traditional benefits perspective. Think of the suppliers, think of the customers, think of society. Okay. So I guess what I want to leave you all with is at the start I spoke about the quote from Pellegrinelli and 10 years ago everyone was sitting in rooms like this and the first conversation we'd all have is what do you mean by program management? Okay? And here we are 10 years later still talking about that same thing. Okay? What I'd hate to have happen is in 10 years time we haven't progressed. Okay. So I guess my call to action for all of you is that as program managers, we're the architects of change and we're the ones that are going to solve the greatest challenges of our time. So what I'd like the conversation to be in 10 years' time is what difference, when we're talking to each other, what difference did you make to the world as a program manager? Thank you. Michael Young. Thank you very much, Michael, for sharing your findings, your research findings with us. Yep. Um, it challenges us. Um, I understood you will be joining us during the rest of this day. So Absolutely. I guess if people are curious to learn more about your findings, they meet up with you during this day. Absolutely. So okay. I'm very happy. Probably we don't have time now to take questions, but I'll be around. Please come and speak to me. Come and ask questions. I'm very happy to talk, very happy to share things. And uh, um, thank you for your... Uh, your attention for this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Michael Young.